Hey folks, previously I mentioned Code on the Beach. That same group is hosting a conference on a cruise ship, Code on the Sea. It's a five-day cruise from Jacksonville, Florida, to the Bahamas, stopping in Nassau and Half Moon Cay, from February 28th through March 5th, 2015. Now these sessions are going to be held on sea days, so you'll have enough time with your family, plenty of time on the ship, explore the Bahamas, through some excursions, and then you'll get to soak in that warm weather in early March. It's uh, sounding better than spending the week back home where it's cold. Speakers will include Eric Meyer, Michael Feathers, and Greg Young. So check out Code on the Sea at codeonthesea.com, and you can save $150 with coupon code Hanselman. Now again, that website is codeonthesea.com. Check it out. From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 433. In this episode, Scott talks with Lara Swanson about designing for performance. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'm talking with Lara Swanson, who's an engineering manager of performance at Etsy. Thanks for chatting with me today. That's my pleasure. You have got an amazing presentation on designing for performance and a really interesting perspective on on performance. Um, you seem to think that design and performance, which I kind of think about as being two separate disciplines, really are the same thing. They need to work together. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. I think that we've thrown performance issues over the wall towards engineers for a very long time, when in fact, the decisions that designers are making heavily influence the end page load time of any given site. Mm -hmm. But how is that not just like, oh, this designer wants to use a hero image with a giant PNG and don't do that? <laughs> totally. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly guidelines and rules, but I think that this is all about striking a balance between aesthetics and performance. Because at the end of the day, what you want is a great user experience. And performance is a part of it, but so is aesthetics. Mm -hmm. So you work at Etsy and Etsy has got like, what is it, like a billion, a billion and a half page views? A lot. A yes. Many, very many. <laughs> So yeah. this, this is something you have to bake into your process at Etsy. Absolutely. And we've got two different kinds of teams working on the site. We've got feature teams who are focused on the end user experience. So a team working on checkout or shops or something like that. And then we've also got uh, engineering infrastructure teams. And these are the folks that support feature those feature teams. Let's say somebody is working on a new experiment. We want to make sure that they're gathering data correctly, that they've got development tools that they need, that they're doing performance and mobile web appropriately. So between these two team, these two kinds of teams, we have a, a collaborative effort into making sure that everything is as great a possible user experience as it can be. Do you think that, that getting people to care about performance as a, uh, as an organization requires a certain amount of organizational will? I mean, everyone has to decide this is important, but it also kind of comes from the top as well. Like, okay, everybody, two seconds matters here at Etsy. Totally. And it's funny. I was the engineering manager for the mobile web team before I was the engineering manager for the performance team. And in both cases, you really do need someone at the top supporting you and empowering everybody within your organization to care about this stuff. In our case for performance, our CEO said page speed matters. It's part of the user experience. On the mobile website, he came out and said, Etsy is a mobile first company and everybody needs to bake this into whatever features or experiments or products they're building. Interesting. Now, mobile sets a whole other tone because you've said in your presentation that users expect two seconds and yes. they start dropping off right after that. You know, it's crazy. When we start to think about performance in terms of mobile, you start to really realize it's aggravating all these issues. We start to talk about latency and mobile connections being, you know, less than ideal. And you've got users globally that have very different sets of infrastructure, older devices, et cetera. So performance really becomes an issue when we start to think about the mobile context. Mm -hmm. And it, so what are some issues that we need to think about? Because I mean, there's the basics of like page weight. Absolutely. So page weight is totally one of the, one of the main things that we can optimize for, especially from a designer perspective. I also like to emphasize that number of requests is a good thing to think about. So how many images are you including? How many CSS files are you including? How can we optimize those? And then I also like to emphasize that 
can you make some savings in terms of what's first loaded on the page? Can you get your first paint optimized so that the page becomes interactive, that there's no scrolling jank, that all those things that go into perceived performance are addressed? What was that word you just said? Scrolling jank? Jank, sorry. So jank is the term for, you know, when you scroll down a page and it starts to stutter? And it's kind of janky. It's kind of janky. Yeah. So if you go to jankfree.org, you can see a ton of resources there to teach you what jank is and how to fix it. Oh, wow. Okay. I have <laughs> never heard that before, but I know janky, but that yeah. is awesome. I've never heard jank as it now. And that's all. I'm now going to use that every day. You know, we actually ran an experiment in which we uh, removed jank from one of our pages. We have an activity feed where users can go and see all of the most recent things their, their friends are favoriting or new, sh- new shops or listing items. And we had a bunch of scrolling jank in this and we removed it. And we saw statistically significantly people were favoriting more items. Now, I'm hearing in everything that you're saying, there's kind of a background thread of we're measuring everything. <laughs> yes. Etsy says, uh, you know, if if it moves, graph it. So for us, we measure <laughs> everything possible. We have hundreds of thousands of graphs at Etsy that we look at. Whether, it, you know, you're deploying something new or you're just running a new experiment, we love to focus on the metrics. Now, this is kind of a, a of a... A sidecar discussion, but I was thinking about all the different things that one can do to make performance better. And my question to you is, how often should people consider doing totally crazy things that are effectively not the standard web? Like you said, well, what can we do to streamline that? Maybe we inline everything, base 64, all the images, sprite the entire site. I mean, those are kind of anti-web in the sense of it wasn't designed that way. But yeah. would that make things better? And should we try crazy stuff like that? You know, it's amazing how many crazy things we've tried that have failed and crazy things that we've tried that have won. You know, again, because we're measuring everything, we have a sense of whether or not something is going to work. We look at things like conversion rate and favorite rate and other, you know, baseline business metrics. But maybe for companies who have other kinds of engagement metrics to look at bounce rate, exit rate, return rate. So for everything we try that's crazy, we always say, did it work? So one example, uh, at a previous company I worked at, we saw, uh, we had a, a homepage that had 10 spots for thumbnails and there were 26 images that rotated in and out of these thumbnails. And we said, you know, what would be crazy is if we just sprited all of these images together and added additional JavaScript and CSS to kind of make it work. And the page got heavier. We said this, I don't know, is this going to be a performance win? But it was, we cut page load time down by 35% with this new spreading technique that was kind of insane. We've tried uh, infinite scrolling and found that that actually didn't work for Etsy. So something we thought was going to be a, like a, a go-to, you know, web standard was actually didn't actually work for our users. So for us, it's all about, you know what, go for it, try it, see if it's going to work. And if it does, you'll know. Infinite scrolling is one of those things where there's times when I'm scrolling and I'm like, man, I really wish this was infinite. But then I'll scroll halfway down and then like my wife will want to send a permalink. And she, you know, because she doesn't, my wife is not technical. She doesn't know what a permalink is. So she's halfway down the page. She grabs the current URL and then sends that and then everyone loses. It's like the whole search results problem. Oh, totally. I I find something and I want to send a link to it. And then I end up sending like a, a session ID. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Again, this comes back to the fact that performance is a big part, but just a part of the use, entire user experience. You know, you really have to think about things globally, which is why it's important for designers to understand how how they impact performance. Yeah. I think it's interesting also that I don't think design some designers and some sites don't realize that the address bar is a design element. Absolutely. Yeah. The URL should matter. Now, yeah. You, you've talked about like a number of seconds and things like that, but I'm also noticing that when you talk about performance, the metrics, the kind of KPIs, the key performance indicators that you're using are business focused. Absolutely. Yeah, it's important, you know, on a couple of levels. So on one level, you want to convince the very important people, the VIPs at your company, that performance matters. You also want to convince everybody around you that performance matters. What I think may be the most challenging part about performance is getting the people around you to care about it too. Culture change is kind of the hardest thing to do when it comes to performance. So what I've found is helpful is correlating performance with business metrics, whatever it is that those folks care about. And that way you can help them champion, you know, performance at your organization. Mm -hmm. So if you've got an organization that's maybe 30% technical, sure, you can say time to first bite to those people. But for the other 70%, you need to be saying bounce rate and uh, click-through rate? You know, even the people who are technical, sometimes it's a challenge. More more often than not, I see 
organizations that have performance cops or performance janitors, people are, you know, who are coming in and playing cleanup for other people's development cycles. And that's just not a sustainable model. So it's really important to convince everybody, even people who you would assume would care about performance, that really this is a huge part of their jobs. Can you explain to me what some of these metrics are? Like, what does bounce rate mean? And how does my performance on my page change that? Absolutely. So as you mentioned earlier, users generally like to leave pages that take longer than than three seconds to load. And ideally, we're aiming for two seconds. Uh, Google is actually suggesting that you aim for first paint in one second. And that means getting something on the screen in under one second. So when we talk about things like bounce rate, we're saying how long it takes your page to load or how long it takes to see something on the page can cause a visitor to just leave your site, to exit it completely. Maybe they just see one page and leave, or maybe they hit a slow page and then they bounce or then they exit. So in these cases, we know that the whole user experience is is affected by how the perceived performance of your site is. So it's really important to be measuring these things. In your presentation, you had one metric where you said uh, 160K gets added to a page, which might be the size of a couple of PNGs. 12% 12% uh, increase in bounce rate on mobile. People just start bailing. Yeah, we found that at Etsy. So we, you know, we have the luxury of running these experiments. And in this case, we slowed down a, a page by adding 160 kilobytes of hidden images just to see what would happen. And on mobile devices, 12% more people left. They just came, saw that one page and left. So we're absolutely able to track the performance impact on, you know, basic engagement metrics. Yeah, I think that my patience sometimes is limited to I'll wait a couple of seconds. Maybe I'll push reload. That's the other thing. I notice that there's uh-huh. certain sites where I'll just hit reload. I don't know why I do that. Like <laughs> yeah, re- hitting totally. reload is just a feature on this site because maybe it'll work better the second time. I'll get Absolutely. a different web server. Yeah. Um, you talk about how removing redirects can increase click-through rate. What do you mean by redirects? Are you talking about like 301s and 302s? Yeah, precisely. So, you know, you may see somebody who has like an M dot. Some, you know, m.xyz.com. Mm-hmm. And those are often mobile subdomains. So, you know, you get a link. It sees that you're coming from a mobile device. It'll redirect you over to a page optimized for your mobile device. This is really bad for performance because of the extra time it takes to go and redirect that visitor. So we recommend generally avoiding redirects for this performance reason. And DoubleClick saw that implementing a redirect actually was a negative user experience. And after removing that redirect, they saw a huge increase in click-throughs on mobile devices. Mm. You know, I I recently blogged about how I think that this tiny URL thing is getting completely out of control. I was given a URL. I forgot what it was for, but I got it on Twitter and it felt slow. So I went in and, uh, you know, sniffed it. I had seven redirects from the Twitter TCO, the t.co to the end result site. Seven, uh, I think it was, I went through Tribal, I went through DoubleClick, I went through a Google shortener and I went through Twitter shortener. That's like, brutal. It was, and it's like, I really don't want the content that bad. Right. Yeah. Nobody's going to wait that long. <laughs> now, questions that people need to be asking when they design, uh, which I think is really important for, for designers is, like you say here, what value does this giant hero image add? Absolutely. Uh, will these three font weights help drive conversions? What metric are we hoping will improve with this carousel? All of these things are things that designers need to be asking themselves as they're making design decisions that, again, impact end page load time. Do you think designers don't often think about that? Do you think that they just go, ah, it's prettier? You know, it's unclear to me where in the process this should start. I think that designers generally are thinking about the user experience overall. They're thinking about content hierarchy and they're thinking about, you know, again, how pretty it is because aesthetics, as we know, contribute to overall user experience. And I think that these are the, this is also the time we need to be asking ourselves these questions about end page load time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you do. It sounds like you do a lot of A/B testing. When, like, if you look at that example of like uh, font weights, you might say, "Well, adding this font weight adds this many k to the page because we're going to go and get download the web font." But people really like it because A/B testing shows that it people want to you know buy more stuff. Is that what you're trying to measure against? Absolutely. And it's going to, there are going to be cases in which those extra font weights win, but you want to have the data. You can't just assume that the prettier it gets, the more people want to buy something or, or whatever. I think that it's really important to run those A-B tests to make sure, yes, indeed, those font weights are driving these engagement metrics, even at the cost of, you know, m- more page load time. Do you build in this A-B testing into the app? I mean, is the, is, is your app as much an app that shows Etsy products as it is an app that does A-B testing, or do you use a third-party A-B testing tool? 
We have an in-house A-B testing tool because it's so central to our mission, this experiment-driven design that we built it ourselves. Doesn't that mean from like a, uh, you know, like the number of features that the Etsy web app has that A-B testing is as big a feature as is being Etsy? Wholeheartedly. You know, it's funny coming here. It's a completely different engineering culture than I'm used to this kind of experiment driven design, but we really build it into our product cycles. We'll spend months iterating on small different pieces of a design. Say the listing page, for example, took us eight months last year to iterate upon. We're measuring all these different combinations of, of changes and design improvements to see what ends up working overall for our users. And again, performance is a huge part of that. And no one complains about this. No one's like, come on, we got to go faster. We got to move quicker. <laughs> it's so cultural that, that no one minds. Absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, it can be frustrating when your experiments aren't winning. More often than not, you find that your best guess didn't win. And I think that that contributes more to burnout than anything else. But no, from a, from a road mapping perspective, we build in the time to run the experiments. Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Telerik. Create compelling app experiences across any screen with the Telerik platform. Telerik's end-to-end platform uniquely combines industry-leading UI tools with cloud services to simplify the entire app development cycle. Telerik offers everything .NET developers need to build quality apps faster. Try it free at telerik.com slash platform. That's telerik.com slash platform. So when we take our application and we run it through something like web page test and we see that big chart and all the colors in it, I think everyone's seen this before, but have we really looked at it and understood what is it that we're seeing and what, what, what should we do? That's a great question. Yeah, that waterfall chart that you're referring to, it can be really confusing, especially the first time you look at it. There are so many colors. What do they all mean? Why are there vertical lines and horizontal lines? So really what it comes down to when you look at web page test is the number of requests. So that's the amount of things that are loaded on the page, the size of those requests, and they could be a few kilobytes, a few megabytes, if you're really unlucky. And then also you want to focus on how you can you optimize the number of connections. So let's say what you mentioned earlier was inlining CSS. Can we actually move our CSS onto the page rather than going and requesting that CSS from a file? And how is this going to end up affecting our overall performance? Mm-hmm. And uh, there's... But there's, there's size of the headers. Absolutely. I've heard people do micro optimizations and say, well, you know, the size of this CSS file is smaller than the headers it cost <laughs> yes, to, to go send and it. get it. Yep. Know, there's so many things to consider as well as, um, caching. It's surprising how few people pay attention to, uh, you know, if not modified since and really use HTTP for themselves. Absolutely. And gzipping. It's surprising. And actually image compression. I mean, there's so many little things that add up to a, there's, I mean, they're low hanging fruit, just turning on gzipping or automating the way that you do image compression. I mean, these are little wins that have a huge improvement on the overall performance. Okay. So then let's, let's, um, let's dig into like one request. Let's say that you're going to go and call uh, Etsy for an image. Maybe you, when you're very first starting out, you guys have built it. You've put a uh, a JPEG up on www.etsy.com, which happens to be the same place you're serving your HTML from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My optimization might be moving that to its own subdomain. Yeah, I mean, test it. Sometimes that some but that's called domain sharding, so splitting a number of uh, assets over a number of different domains. Sometimes that can be a performance win. Sometimes it actually takes longer because you have to do the DNS lookup for all those additional domains, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one thing you can try. Again, measure it and see what happens. Another thing you can try is op- choosing a different image format. So maybe you have an image with very few colors in it. That may be better for a PNG8 than a JPEG. Maybe you have transparency that you don't need. Eliminating that transparency and changing it to a JPEG could be great. Maybe you just haven't run it to that final compression step before uploading it. Maybe you're serving it at the wrong size. You know, you have this huge image that's scaled down for a different size. These are all things that you can look at when you're, when you're looking to optimize just a single image. Okay. And then maybe putting gzip on, on your CDN that handles your JPEGs might not be a good idea because gzipping doesn't give you anything. It might just slow things down. Yeah, GZIP will actually help you with text assets, but not so much for image assets. Mm -hmm. So GZIP will help with HTML and CSS. If GZIPing is so important, if HTTP compression is so important and and everyone should have GZIP on, why do we bother minifying CSS? 
Oh, so GZIP will help you find additional compression methods. So it looks for patterns within your CSS. Let's say, for example, vendor prefixes, and it'll help you shrink and modify those too. Okay, so but minifying is totally a good additional step. Okay, so minifying is totally important, and just because you GZIP doesn't mean you get to not do the other. <laughs> right? Yeah, totally. Okay. You should definitely do both. Do you think that that it's important for an application to to kind of build itself? Like the one that you run in dev is different than the one that you run in production? Or are you running, you know, how, how many levels do you have as far as dev, test, staging, production, and how squishy, how squished does it get as it moves its way towards actually going live? That's a really good question. So we have three different environments. We have our development environments. We've got, you know, virtual machines that we all work on independently. We've got a staging environment, which we call princess. So princess saves us. And then we've got a live production environment, which is, you know, obviously we test everything there. Princess, so talk to me about princess. Princess saves, yeah. she saves herself or she saves everyone? She saves everybody. So we run tests on princess as we're working through and about to deploy to production. And so princess saves us, <laughs> princess helps us out a lot. And what is, what is the princess's responsibilities? So princess, ha- we, it's basically our staging environment. We, we can see what's as close as possible to production as possible. Uh, and so we run all these tests and we can ch- check things on princess before we end up going live to production. Mm-hmm. It's, it seems like everyone has really cool about in, in, um, <laughs> internal tools. I know that like Netflix has got like chaos monkey. Yes. And, and things like that. What other tools do you have internally that help you with the performance? My favorite is, is Pushbot. So within our IRC, we actually, oh, I should back up and say Etsy practices continuous deployment. Mm. So we're constantly pushing out changes to the web every day. We have, I think, upwards of 50 deploys each day. And we have certain, you know, push queue hours where you can hop in the push queue and, and this is all happens in IRC. So Pushbot is a bot. And this helps us make sure that everything is going smoothly for pushing to production. It will, you can hop in the push queue and push bots like, Hey, I saw you hopped in. Go ahead and, and push all your changes to us. And it says, Hey, I'm going to run some tests and I'm going to push you to princess. And then, Hey, more tests. And I'm going to push you to production. So it's actually one of our, one of my favorite things is, is the push bot. When you, and forgive my ignorance, but this, my whole, all my questions are ignorant. I feel like sometimes. <laughs> But if you're pushing to production 50 times, people say that. Mm -hmm. And more and more we hear about this, like WordPress, you know, we push 120 times. How am I going to get performance if like CSS is changing every time? Or are you, you know, if you're pushing everything, uh, that's going to invalidate caching. Yeah. So that's actually one of the big challenges of working with a very large engineering team. We have, I think at this point, more than 170 engineers. So not only instilling these values in everybody is difficult, but also, you know, the fact that it's changing all the time, the fact that we have to have separate page specific CSS in addition to our baseline CSS is a performance challenge. That's going to be two CSS requests on every page. Mm-hmm. So for us, we absolutely have to weigh all the performance gains alongside what is realistic for a continuous deployment environment. Mm-hmm. What What are some things though, that someone needs to consider when they're doing continuous deployment of web things that doesn't just undo performance. Like if I hit yeah. Etsy tomorrow, uh, maybe there's 80, re- 80 deployments happen between the time I looked at it today and yesterday. Is some of the site changed, but uh, p- other parts are cached? And are yes. you keeping track of that? Definitely. And we do a lot of watching of what's being cached and what's being invalidated. So whenever you deploy, part of your responsibility is to check all of these graphs. And, you know, we're looking for what we call three-armed sweaters, which are our 404 pages uh, and various other kinds of, cl- you know, client errors. Mm-hmm. We're looking for uh, overall engagement metrics. So did checkouts dip or spike? Did number of pages dip or spike? We're also looking for performance metrics. So we have our top pages and the dashboard uh, that we look at for deploys. And we can see, did any page load times increase? Did any backend load times increase? Did any front end load times increase? And so we can, uh, we can actually see in those graphs, we have vertical lines showing when deployments happened. So we can measure any kinds of major differences alongside when deployments happened. And are you, have you baked in kind of like, uh, ca- what they call them, like cache breakers where you add in a query string, uh, on your CSS to say, I really need you to go and get this new one, even though it has the same file name? Or how do you manage that? Yeah. So we, we do have a change to the URL. Uh, but it won't be a query string. Believe it or not, query strings, if you have any sort of like question mark, V equals, or, you know, whatever, mm-hmm. most servers actually don't even cache those because they know that they'll change. So I would have recommended avoiding that entirely. Mm. Hot tip. Mm. Uh, instead, it's, so it's base.0002.css. Oh, okay. So it might be 
foo.css in, in dev, but by the time yes. it gets out to production, it's long number. Precisely. And so when we're compiling that entire CSS file, we're also concatenating a number of what was previously separate CSS files. I see. But how do you keep yourself from getting into these situations where it looks weird because, you know, someone visited on Tuesday and then they came back a week later and they got a different version. And then your answer is hit control F5. You know, <laughs> it'll probably yeah. look better then. Do you, do you have those situations where someone updated a font in a base CSS and the whole site looks weird for a minute? I don't think that we do. And mostly because we start to have what we call dark changes, where we're slowly pushing changes to CSS and getting them cached and getting them in people's browsers before we reflect the change in the page that people see. So because we practice continuous deployment, we're able to start making very subtle shifts before actually making or before actually implementing the experiment itself. Interesting. So does that mean that it might be more like a, like another hot tip? Uh, don't necessarily like change a font color of a known, well-known CSS name, rather add a new one. Oh, totally. And then later change the element to point to that new CSS. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's, see, that's going to change my life right there. <laughs> that's cool. interesting. That's um, great. You also point out that uh, people love gradients and they like yes. to do gradients with images and background images that are tiled, but maybe people should be doing that differently. Yeah, to me, CSS3 gradients are incredibly powerful. I actually, uh, I used to, it hasn't been updated in a while. I used to run a website, a Tumblr called CSS3 Geometry Daily. And this was fun because you get to experiment all with CSS gradients and creating different kinds of pictures. Even if it's not what you would normally consider as gradients, you know, one color to another color, you can create all sorts of different shapes and styles and, and everything else. So for me, gradients are extremely powerful. They are hot tip, a contributor just to, again, jank. So be careful with how much CSS3 you use, but absolutely, they're a good replacement for images. So when you talk about images, what you're doing is you're going and fetching a request. And again, fetching a request takes a while. You have to, your browser has to go and ask a server for the file. The file will eventually come back, and then that, that file will be rendered on the page. So in skipping all of that talking and all that communication, by serving up either a data URI, which is like a text version of an image, or by serving a, a, a CSS3 gradient or, or something else, a shape, you're able to eliminate that request. So substituting images with these kinds of things is really helpful. Oh, SVG2. Mm -hmm. And is it important for a performance engineer to understand once these things show up into the browser, what's going to be using the GPU versus the CPU and making the smart decisions there as well? That's getting into some micro optimizations, which I think is important. That's like a 401 for performance. Mm -hmm. When I talk to designers, I do, and we'll come back to Jank now, actually. So when we're talking about all these things, we're really talking about repaints. And the browser is really trying very hard to understand what's happening on the page at any given time. When we start to change the color or the shadow or, you know, the height or the width of an element on the page, the browser has to repaint at least that part of the page and maybe more than just that part of the page. So by using things like CSS3, we're actually saying, hey, let's affect some part of the page and, and change it up, which is why we, it contributes to jank overall. Mm -hmm. And how do you keep track or find, how do you discover or narrow down when I'm scrolling that uh, this element or that CSS gradient or this rule is causing the screen to, to repaint? Because I think we've all had that experience where we're scrolling down and something flashed as the yeah. entire page repainted. There's two ways. Both are within Chrome DevTools. So for me, it's really, and actually, I would be interested in hearing what IE is doing as well in this, mm -hmm. in this area. But in Chrome, you can see the frames per second. It will actually have like a little window that hovers for you. What you're looking for is to be always above 60 frames per second. Mm -hmm. It's kind of as, as much as the eye can see without stuttering. If you're scrolling and you see that dip down maybe to 30 frames per second, you know you've hit an area of the page that's problematic. You can pop open Chrome DevTools and it will show you how long it's taking things to be repainted. And it'll actually also help you show like, per frame what's happening and this way you can start to find which parts of your page are triggering it mm -hmm. yeah um ie uh, ie i think 11 added a thing called ui responsiveness awesome where they show loading scripting gc styling rendering and then they actually keep frames per second throughout as a big long timeline and then you can see where it dropped down so like right now i'm, I'm doing this on your website right now <laughs> Um, I just dropped from 60 frames a second to 39. I can click on that moment in time. And it looks like the reason that it dropped down is it requested the speaker deck slide player. Oh, that would explain it. And that was the moment when that, that frames per second kind of dropped down. So interesting. Okay. So frames per second is an, is an important thing to remember. And then while I'm scrolling around, 
watching what's happening on my timeline as it relates to my moment in time where I'm doing a, my frame per second. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. What um, what do people need to be thinking about when it comes to fonts? Because I know that I like to just throw a bunch of fonts in the head and I forget <laughs> about it. I don't really think about fonts. You know, it's funny. Fonts to me are like the bane of my existence. I get it. They're pretty. They really do <laughs> add to a site. But personally, I cannot see uh, loading more than one font weight. Again, I'm not a designer by trade, so uh, this is probably not my argument to make. But I firmly believe that on mobile devices, avoid web fonts as much as possible. The reason why this is, is you're, again, requesting. So you're requesting these fonts from the server, and it takes a long time to get them back and forth. They can range in sizes. I can't remember. I think it's the top one on Google can be more than 200K, just based on which kind of language support you have for it. Mm. There's a couple of ways to avoid this. Mm-hmm. One is to not use web fonts, which is my number one rule. But again, not a designer, meaning, so I can't just Meaning go- use the ones that come in box with the browser. Yes, absolutely. But again, I understand that this is not always feasible. So the second thing you can start to do is figure out how to character subset your fonts. And this means picking and choosing which characters you should be using within a given font. So let's say your site only uses Latin characters, the standard alphabet, punctuation, etc. Go ahead and subset your font just to make sure that you're only loading the characters that you need. Or let's say you're using a font just to load the title of your site. So lauraswanson.com is in a special font. I can subset a character, a character base and say, only use L, A, R, S, W, et cetera, and say, only include these characters in my font file. Really? Yeah. There's a couple of different ways to do this. If you're using Google fonts, they make it super easy. Uh, you can basically follow their instructions and they'll, they'll walk you through how to load either a specific subset, like a language support or a specific individual characters. But if you have your own font that you're loading, go to fontsquirrel.com and they have a web font generator that will allow you to just pick and choose individual characters or entire subsets. So my first reaction to that was like, gosh, there's only 26 characters. Why do I really need to think about just <laughs> these eight? But with Unicode, there could be hundreds, thousands of characters, depending on how broad that font is intending to be. Yeah, all the accents, absolutely. So while it might seem like that's a micro-optimization, it really isn't, especially if the only thing you need is to say Etsy. Yeah, precisely. I don't need a Cyrillic code base, for example. You know, really think through how much support you need for your web font. Very cool. Well, so people can go up to to lauraswanson.com slash design to see your fantastic presentation that you've given at Fluent and other uh, other conferences as well. Yeah. And I assume they can also find videos of you presenting all over the place. And you've got a great series of resources, studies, tools, and techniques. But most importantly, uh, you've got a book now, don't you? <laughs> I do, yeah. So the first three chapters are available for early release on O'Reilly.com. The book title is Designing for Performance. And actually, this week, they're running a special promotion on all early release books. So you can find a coupon code for 50% off if you go to the website. Okay, cool. We'll make sure to put in a link to the show notes to, so if people can go and take a look at Designing for Performance, get that coupon and get the early release right now. Thanks so much for chatting with me today. Thank you so much. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Music